and uh, Jeremiah is going to come up and give us today's scripture. Good morning, everyone. If you would please stand for the reading of God's word. We're continuing in our series in Proverbs this morning. I have three passages that we're going to read from. Proverbs 14, 31, Proverbs 21, verse 3, and Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9. They'll be on the screen if you would like to follow along. Hear now the word of the Lord. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. I'll ask Justin to come up and I'll pray for him. Father God, we love you, we praise you, and we worship you. God, we give you glory in this place this morning. And Lord, would you be glorified through the words that you have given to justice, Justin for us as a church this morning. We pray, Lord God, that we would open our hearts to receive from you and your word, that, Lord, we would grow in wisdom through your word, and that, God, our hearts would be open to do justice and righteousness in the world that you have placed us. Speak clearly through Justin. God, move on our hearts today. Would your Holy Spirit change us from the inside out? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I, I took on this topic of justice, but I don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that I'm kind of named after this topic, but um, yeah. Tammy and I, uh, we live just off of Nose Hill Park, right close by here, and I spend a lot of time in the park biking and occasionally running in it, but several times over the past few years, I've watched coyotes stalking deer. Um, waiting to pounce on the weakest and most vulnerable of the herd. And they very patiently wait. In fact, they can wait for up to an hour or more, I think, uh, crouched in the grass. And you can see them slowly inching forward as they tighten their circle around the herd of deer. And they, of course, focus on the weakest in the herd. And so I ask you, uh, why is no one protesting this and saying that this is completely unjust? and must be stopped. When humans do this, when we uh, prey on the most vulnerable of our society, we have seriously strong reactions, don't we? We see it as unjust. We humans have a, some sense of innate justice. Uh, of course, societies and people do end up with a twisted view of justice as a result of sin, right? Leading to oppression and injustice and things like slavery. But what exactly is this justice I'm speaking about? Uh, where does it come from, and what does the Bible say about justice? Well, this morning, we're going to take a look at several different proverbs, but we're also going to make our way from the creation account uh, and take a high-level look throughout the Bible and see what the Bible says about justice in the mission of God here in the world. So let's take a look at the four main points that we're going to cover today. Our first point is this, that all people deserve respect and dignity because they are images of God. Here we're going to go back to the story of creation and we're going to see how the truth that we are created in the image of God is central to our concept of justice. Next, we're going to look at the fact that the way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. Here we're going to look at the life of Abraham, and we're going to define these two words that are really important for us, and we're also going to look to the life of Job as an example of a life of righteousness and justice. Number three, God hears the cries of the oppressed and needy. Uh, for this point, we're going to look at a few more examples in the Old Testament of God being close to the oppressed and the needy. We will see something of his compassionate heart and how it is key it is a key part of justice. And fourthly, uh, Jesus is our perfect righteousness and justice. 
At the end, we will look at the life, death, and resurrection of Christ from the vantage point of justice, and we'll see how the righteous life that he lives today is offered to you and me. And if there's nothing else that you take away here today, here is what I want you to leave with. Living a life of justice means making other people's problems our problems. It means disadvantaging ourselves for the advantage of others. So let's just jump right away into point one. All people deserve respect and dignity because they are images of God. So let's take a look back at the beginning to the very first page of the Bible, back to Genesis 1. I'm going to jump in at uh, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and, of, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. Now, since we're all made in the image of God, all humans are therefore equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who they are. Now, this concept of us being made in God's image is why we believe that human life is sacred. And this is what separates us from the rest of creation, which, of course, we are to care for and steward precisely because we're made in the image of the creator himself. Now, there is a sacredness to human life. Proverbs 14, 31, which we read earlier, says, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Because this poor man is, in fact, the image of God, he must be shown respect and dignity, the same as any other human being. Now, we can certainly come up with all sorts of examples of people in societies that do not embrace this, um, but I would say that there is a sense of justice in all of our hearts. However, sin, of course, corrupts it, and at times we humans have seriously messed this up. For example, for virtually all of human history, still today, there has been slavery on the earth. So the fact that we are divine image bearers, every single human being on the planet, means that all of us have equal worth. It does not matter what language you speak. It does not matter what race or gender you are. It does not matter how smart you are, how rich you are, or even how nice you are. Dr. Martin Luther King uh, understood this principle very well. In fact, it was the, formed the foundation to the whole civil rights movement that he led. In fact, in his famous sermon, American Dream, he said this, the whole concept of the image of God is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that they have substantial unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him uniqueness, it gives him worth, it gives him dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. We will one day, we will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. The fact that we are all made in the image of God forms the basis of our concept of justice. So again, the point here being is that all people deserve respect and dignity because they are images of God. So I ask us all, who are the people that you find most difficult to treat with respect and dignity? Who are the people that you find most difficult to treat with respect and dignity? And the next point that I want us to understand and remember is this. The way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. So we're going to jump ahead a few more chapters to the life of Abraham. We get to learn a little bit more about God's heart for justice. God says here in verse 19, For I have chosen him, Abraham, that he may command his children and his household after him, 
to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now these two words, righteousness and justice, uh, are often found together in the Bible like this. Uh, There's a great connection between the two words. That's important to understand. So let's take a look at these two words and see exactly what they mean in this context. Now righteousness is a very religious sounding word for most of us. Uh, Most of us don't really know what it means, but if I were to ask you what it means, you would probably say something like, it means to be a good person. Or maybe you would say it means to be right or correct. The Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah. Used here and throughout the scriptures, it means to be right with God and to be in a right relationship with God uh, and therefore, as a result, committed to putting right all other relationships in life. That's where this biblical word of righteousness comes from. So biblical righteousness is all about right relationships or healthy relationships throughout our lives. It's actually very practical and it isn't actually religious at all. In fact, it touches our family, our workplaces, our communities, our society. Now, the Hebrew word for justice is mishvat, and it has two modes or meanings. The first is this concept of retributive justice, and this is often what we think of when we think of justice. And it, it means that when you steal $5, you need to give $5 back. It's a concept of punishment also. It's the court of law in our society. Uh, while this type of justice is what we normally think of, it's not really the main Uh, mode of justice that we find in the scriptures. Now, the second mode of justice is restorative justice, and this is the most common form of justice that we find referred to in scripture. And this mode of justice is all about ensuring that people are treated fairly. It is defending the vulnerable and the oppressed. It's about changing laws. It's about changing circumstances so that others are treated as bearers of the image of God. It's being proactive. It's listening for the cries of oppression. This mode of justice uh, for us today can mean many things, but it will include caring for refugees arriving cold and alone in Calgary. It might be a family adopting orphan children. It could be giving your money, your time, and resources to a family in need. It's treating the panhandler out in front of Superstore with respect as a fellow human being made in the image of God. This summary, this following summary has been very helpful for me to wrap my head around all of this, and it helps me uh, see the link between righteousness and justice. It says, the, righteousness, the righteous are those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to the advantage of the community. The wicked are those who are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. Now, a great example of this, of living out righteousness and justice, is Job. In Job 29, we find Job defending himself and explaining himself a little bit. Starting at verse 12, I'll read, For I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. I helped those without hope, and they blessed me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Everything I did was honest. Righteousness, tzedakah, covered me like a robe, and I wore justice, mishpat, like a turban. I served as eyes for the blind and feet for the lame. I was a father to the poor and assisted strangers who needed help. I broke the jaws of godless oppressors and plucked their victims from their teeth. What I learned from Job here is that he was obviously not passive. He did not wait for the vulnerable to come to him and ask for help. My sense is that he pursued and actively did justice in his time. He had an incredible heart for the vulnerable and the needy. He did not have a hard heart, but one of compassion. Yet, at the same time, he wasn't a wimp. He could still go out and actually break people's jaws. He stood up for people and used his power and influence to defend the vulnerable and the oppressed. Proverbs 29, verse 7 says, The righteous care about the justice, about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. 
And I ask myself, do I even understand what the issues of injustice are for the poor here in Calgary? Do I really understand and have concerns with the issues that lead, to, lead someone to being homeless? Do I care about issues of addiction and mental health? Do I care about the immigrant who struggles to find work because of all sorts of reasons? My line of work in managing Bible translation work among my uh, indigenous peoples around the world has me working on the fringes of injustice and justice issues for indigenous peoples. I, I began my work uh, in Peru in South America. I worked as an adult literacy specialist. So for many years, I helped uh, marginalized indigenous peoples begin to publish books in their languages, uh, as well as develop reading and writing programs. Most of these community reading programs were run by local churches for their communities. Now it was really exciting watching women in particular who had never had the opportunity to go to school, watch them begin to read for themselves. And in this case, seeing mothers begin to read meant that their children were more likely to actually attend school and succeed in school. It was one small yet significant contribution to writing an unjust system, systemic issues of poverty in that culture, in that space. Now I know that here in Canada, uh, this is a complex issue, the issue of poverty. And sadly, it often becomes very political. So at the risk of sounding rather political, let me say this. <laughs> if we as a church in Canada genuinely care about justice for the poor, we have no choice but to wade into the waters of our own history of unjust treatment of indigenous people. We have no choice but to care. It's messy. Again, caring about justice is a messy and difficult topic. Across Canada, about 40% of Indigenous children live in poverty. <clears throat> Sorry. Indigenous adults living on reserve are twice as likely as the average Canadian to deal with mental illness, intergenerational trauma, caused through things like residential schools is strong today. Real estate has been a driving force of wealth here in Canada for generations, yet indigenous peoples are still, I, I can't wrap my head around this, are still not allowed, according to the Indian Act of 1867, to actually own land on a, on a reserve. Now to work alongside the Siksika Nation, or the Tsutina, the Stony Nakoda Nation. To work towards justice and reconciliation is not easy, but it is good. It's the way of righteousness and justice, the way of the Lord. If you're wondering how you might get involved or educate yourself about these matters, I'd suggest the following website by the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, where you'll be able to find out a lot of great ideas of how Christians in Canada can get involved in these types of issues, go to evangelicalfellowship.ca backslash indigenous relations. Again, to our point here, the way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. So I ask all of us this question, what injustice in the world do you deeply care about? And what is God asking you to do about it? What injustice in the world do you deeply care about? And what is God asking you to do about it? The next point I want us to understand and remember is this, that God hears the cries of the oppressed and the needy. Jumping ahead to the Psalms where we read this morning, we read a little bit more of God's heart for justice and getting to see, a, in here in this passage, we get to see a few more categories of people that are vulnerable and in need from Psalm 146, again, I'm going to read, God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, 
The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. So God is near to the vulnerable. He watches over them. He watches over all of them. His heart is near to the marginalized, the refugee, the prisoner, the orphan. Now the next scene I want us to look at is that of the Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus 6. I'm going to jump in at verse 5 where it says, Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out of out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. God heard their cries. God acts with justice. This Exodus story is uh, one of the most celebrated stories, of course, in Jewish history. And there is so much we can learn about God here. He's not distant. He listens to the cries of the oppressed. And he will ultimately respond and bring justice. Yet it's hard to ignore the fact that it was not long after this very story before Israel themselves became the oppressors. And there's another truth in here about justice. We are all sinners and give in to sin. Throughout history, including today, we see that people who were once oppressed by others can quickly themselves turn into oppressors we tend to have very short memories. So God sends prophets to speak on his behalf in the scriptures. For the most part, these prophets were confronting wickedness and injustice in Israel's society. It was often pointed at the leaders, at those in positions of authority and power. Acts of injustice are often done by the powerful towards the vulnerable of society. And this is what God addresses over and over through the prophets And it is still no different today. But many of the prophets' calls have to do, are are to the average Israelite who simply began to ignore the cries of the oppressed. Their injustice and sin was not always one of active oppression, but instead was one of apathy. It was a passive ignoring of injustice. So instead of doing justice, they instead put their focus on religious activities on fasting and making sacrifices to God. So in Zechariah 7, we read this. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one, to one another, do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard. So here we see that the whole society, all the people of the land, including the priests, had become focused on religious activities instead of compassionately doing justice. They thought that sacrificing comfort through fasting is what God really wanted, but they were getting it all wrong. They were focused on themselves, and they ignored the vulnerable. Throughout the scriptures, we see four common categories of vulnerable people. So I want to go over those right now. First, you hear of widows. Since if a, if a woman had no husband, it meant she was very vulnerable to abuse, to slavery, and potential starvation. The fatherless or orphans, these children are similar to the widow, that they were vulnerable to abuse, to slavery, and starvation. The next category is the sojourner. And it means the foreigner or those that wander. These were vulnerable since they would not have land and thus would not have a way to provide for their basic needs. It could be that they had fled famine in their own land or war and were now forced to wander as refugees. 
So they were also very vulnerable, much like Noemi, Noemi was in the book of Ruth. The fourth category is the poor. Now in Israel society, the poor were often people who had for some reason lost their land. And uh, the issue of, you know, this was significant because generally land equated to wealth. And this issue of land was very important. And for this reason, God established many laws regarding land, uh, the just distribution of land, um, and even the return of land to those who were forced to give it up for some reason. Now, switching gears and going to another prophet, Micah, Micah also addressed issues of injustice. One of the most famous passages on the topic of justice is found here in Micah 6. And let me read from verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This issue of becoming outwardly focused on religious things and religious activities in this case, in this case making sacrifices, is not what God ultimately wants. I find this challenging personally. While I haven't exactly considered you know, sacrificing my firstborn son, I have often fallen into the trap of simply going through the motions of religious activities in my life. That is, attending church every Sunday, or giving 10% of my income to the church and the poor, and reading my Bible and praying every day. These are all great activities and important things, but have they replaced doing justice? Have they replaced loving kindness? And when I honestly stop and look at my life, I'm not much different than those to whom Micah is speaking here. One of our passages that we read this morning, Proverbs 21.3, continues this theme of being overly religious. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Jesus spoke often about this issue of being overly focused on external religious activities to the, to the exclusion of the most important things. In Luke 11, we read, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb <clears throat> and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. So what Jesus is saying here is, that we must give to the poor out of a sincere heart, God is most concerned with our hearts and not so much with, our, with the superficial things that we do. Now, it's important to note that Jesus didn't say to the Pharisees that they should stop tithing and being generously giving to the poor, but instead, he put the focus back on the heart. He wanted them to care for the poor out of a sense of love and mercy, not out of a sense of rule following and obligation. Again, the point of this section is this. God hears the cries of the oppressed and needy, and so should we, right? So where and how have you acted more as an oppressor than an agent of justice? I ask us this. Where and how have you acted more as an oppressor than an agent of justice? And so we move on to our last point. And that is Jesus is our perfect righteousness and justice. In the midst of this human legacy of injustice and wickedness, God sends us this most generous and very undeserved gift, his son. Jesus did not simply come to earth to lecture us about righteousness and justice. No, Jesus came to earth and entered into the deep and dark injustice of the world. Jesus was born to a very poor and young woman. Her fiancé was also a simple and poor man from a far-off and forgotten village, a place looked down upon by others. In fact, they would have been discriminated against because of the way they talked. 
being simple peasants from Galilee. He was born into a community that was ruthlessly ruled by a violent regime. Death, injustice, and genocide were always at hand. The first two years of Jesus' life, he lived as a refugee child in Egypt. I cannot imagine how difficult it was for Mary and Joseph to simply stay alive during their years as refugees. Paul wrote in Philippians 2 the following, at verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He became one of us, and not as a powerful king, as most would expect him to do, but he came in the most humble and lowly way, a poor and oppressed peasant. This should give us tremendous hope and comfort, knowing that God, the God of the universe, the God who holds the stars in his hand, is near to us, and he's near to the poor. He's not so high and mighty and distant. No, he's close in our suffering. He's close to the broken. In Luke 4, Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah, and he claimed to fulfill this particular prophecy. Let's read it from Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was born right into injustice. Yet his life, his ministry, and ultimately his death perfectly fulfilled God's heart for righteousness and justice. His death, in particular, was just completely enveloped in injustice. He was illegally arrested and beaten. He was brought before the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish court, at night, again illegally, no charge was able to stick. When he was brought before Herod, neither of them found him guilty, yet they beat him and hung him on a cross. Isaiah 53 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Yet he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. But then he rose from the dead, and God declared him to be righteous, and he still lives today. And now the righteousness and just the righteous and just life that he currently lives, he freely offers to us so that we can be declared righteous before God and we can be free of darkness and sin in our own lives. Now, the earliest followers of Jesus embraced this new life and it changed everything and began to compel them to follow the example of the life of Jesus. And they became known for their care for the poor and vulnerable. Social justice became their trademark, and yet it was never their good works or their justice work that made them righteous before God. It was simply their belief that the death of Jesus made them right before God and motivated them to follow Jesus. You and I can have that exact same life. We can be made right in our relationship with our Creator. Our ugly deeds, our sin can all be wiped away. The Bible tells us that we can have a new life. We can be born again. And once we have experienced this new life, this life that you and I do not deserve, you and I will be compelled to live like Jesus, a life of mercy, a life of righteousness and justice. And we can follow the example of Jesus. It's a radical way of life. It is not an easy way. It is not a convenient life. Living a life of justice means making other people's problems our problems. 
It means disadvantaging yourself for the advantage of others. But it's so worth it. Let's pray and give ourselves over to him right now. Let's pray. Gracious and generous Father, uh, we are just in awe at how compassionate you are and how you are so close to the vulnerable and the needy. Thank you for sending your Son to take our sin and our shame. Thank you for offering us new life, resurrection life. We give ourselves to you. We need you. Without you, we are selfish and greedy and unjust people. Guide us into lives of compassionate and generous justice. Show us how to live in this time and place and use us for your kingdom. And may may we as a church family live out righteousness and justice right here in Calgary for your glory and in your name we pray. Amen.